U.S. Secretary of Commerce Harry Hopkins' visit to Moscow was of crucial importance to the whole future of American-Soviet and Anglo-Soviet relations. Hopkins was also director of the Lend-Lease program and Roosevelt's closest advisor on foreign policy during World War II. For these reasons, his advice was of paramount importance. Hopkins reached the Soviet capital on the morning of 30 July 1941 five and a half weeks after the German invasion, and had a briefing with Stalin that evening. As Robert E. Sherwood wrote, The flight from Archangelsk to Moscow had taken four hours, and during that time Hopkins began to be reassured as to the future of the Soviet Union. He looked down upon the hundreds of miles of solid forest, and he thought that Hitler, with all the panzer divisions of the Wehrmacht, could never hope to break through country like this. On arriving in Moscow, and before meeting with Stalin, Hopkins had a long talk with U.S. Ambassador Steinhardt, in which he said that the main purpose of his visit was to determine whether the situation was as disastrous as pictured in the War Department. Steinhardt said to Hopkins that anyone who knew anything about Russian history would hardly jump to the conclusion that the Germans would achieve easy conquest. In his opinion, Russian soldiers might appear inept when engaged in offensive operations, as they had done so in the Napoleonic Wars and again in Finland, but when they were called upon to defend their homeland, they were superb fighters. Steinhardt emphasized that it was supremely difficult for any outsider to get a clear picture of what was really going on, because of the prevailing attitude of suspicion toward all foreigners and consequent secretiveness. Hopkins said that he was determined somehow or other to break through this wall of silence. The account that follows, where Hopkins tells about his first meeting with Stalin, is extremely interesting. It is, in fact, the only detailed first-hand account there is of Stalin at the height of the German invasion. This is what the US Secretary recalled about the Soviet leader. He welcomed me with a few swift Russian words. He shook my hand briefly, firmly, courteously. He smiled warmly. There was no waste of word, gesture or mannerism. It was like talking to a perfectly coordinated machine, an intelligent machine. The questions he asked were clear, concise, direct. His answers were ready, unequivocal, spoken as if the man had had them on his tongue for years. If he is always as I heard him, he never wastes a syllable. If he wants to soften an abrupt answer, he does it with the quick managed smile. A smile that can be cold, but friendly, austere, but warm. He carries no favour with you. He seems to have no doubts. He assures you that Russia will stand against the onslaught of the German army. He takes it for granted that you have no doubts either. He laughs often enough, but it's a short laugh. Somewhat sardonic, perhaps. There is no small talk in him. His humour is keen, penetrating. Hopkins then recalls the details of the meeting. After introductory remarks that the US President believed the most important thing to be done in the world today was to defeat Hitler, and that he therefore wished to aid the Soviet Union, Stalin welcomed Hopkins to the Soviet Union, and then, describing Hitler and Germany, spoke of the necessity of there being a minimum moral standard between all nations. Then turning to the question what Russia would require that the USA could deliver immediately, and, second, what would be her requirements on the basis of a long war, Stalin listed in the first category anti-aircraft guns together with ammunition, and in the second one he asked for machine guns and a million rifles, saying that if the caliber was the same as the one used in the Red Army, then he had plenty of ammunition. He also mentioned high-octane aviation gasoline, aluminium for the construction of aircraft and other items. And then came this striking remark from Stalin. Give us anti-aircraft guns and the aluminium and we can fight for three or four years. Stalin then said that Soviet tank production was now only 1,000 per month and Russia would soon be short of steel. He urged that orders for this steel be placed at once. 
Later he said it would be much better if his tanks could be manufactured in the United States. He also wished to purchase as many tanks as possible to be ready for the spring campaign. He said the all important thing was the production of tanks during the winter. He would like to send a tank expert to the United States and would give the United States his tank design. He gave a much more glowing account of Russia's aircraft position and said that the German claims of Russian losses were absurd. Nevertheless, he expressed considerable interest in training pilots in America and left Hopkins the impression that there would soon be a shortage of pilots. Stalin repeatedly stated that he did not underestimate the German army. Their organization was of the very best and they had large reserves of food, men, supplies and fuel. The German army, he said, is therefore capable of taking part in a winter campaign in Russia. He thought, however, that it would be more difficult for the Germans to operate offensively much after September 1st, when the heavy rains would begin. After October the 1st, the ground would be so bad that they would have to go on the defensive. He expressed great confidence that during the winter months, the front line would probably extend not more than a hundred kilometers away from where it was now. He also thought the Germans were tired and had no stomach for an offensive. Though Germany could bring up 40 divisions, making 275 divisions in total, these probably would not get there before the hard weather set in. Regarding ports of entry, he thought Archangelsk difficult but not impossible, since icebreakers could keep it free all winter. Vladivostok he thought dangerous, as Japan could cut it off at any time, and the roads and railroads of Persia inadequate. He repeatedly expressed his confidence that the Russian lines would hold within 200 kilometers maximum of their present position. It is clear from what Hopkins told Stalin that he was not entirely convinced that the Russians would be able to hold until the winter. He wrote, I was mindful of the importance that no economic conference be held in Moscow until we knew the outcome of the battle now in progress. This battle was still in the balance. Hence my suggestion that we hold this conference at as late a date as possible. Then we would know whether there was to be a front and approximately the location of the front during the coming winter months. In conclusion, Stalin said that he thought the German morale pretty low and that the Germans would be demoralized still further by an announcement that the United States was going to join in the war against Hitler. Stalin said it was inevitable that we would finally come to grips with Hitler on some battlefield. The might of Germany was still so great that even though Russia might defend herself, it would be very difficult for Britain and Russia combined to crush the German military machine. He believed the war would be bitter and perhaps long, and he wanted me to tell the President that he would welcome American troops on any part of the Russian front under the complete command of the American army. Finally, he asked me to tell the President that, while he was confident that the Russian army could withstand the German army, the problem of supply by the next spring would be a serious one, and that he needed our help. Although Hopkins had, obviously, come with instructions which forbade him to assume that the Russians would not be defeated before the winter had set in, Stalin not only enormously impressed him as a person, but also convinced him that the Russians would hold the Germans and were preparing for a very long war. He had the feeling that a man who feared immediate defeat would not have put aluminium so high on the list of priorities. The very nature of Stalin's requests proved that he was viewing the war on a long-range basis. Hopkins later expressed extreme irritation with the military observers in Moscow when they cabled at darkly pessimistic reports that could be based on nothing more than mere guesswork, coloured by prejudice. As Worth remarks, this account of the meetings with Stalin is truly unique. Several points are worth noting. Anxious to obtain American aid, Stalin painted a more favourable picture than was warranted by the progress of the war at the end of July 1941. He carefully avoided any suggestion 
of the Red Army's acute shortage of tanks and aircraft. He knew that he could hardly expect anything at once, and therefore stressed himself the desirability of building up the Soviet Air Force and armour in readiness for a spring campaign in 1942. He quite deliberately created the impression of planning for a long-term war. But he was not carrying favours. He took it for granted that it was in both Britain's and America's interests to help Russia. He went, of course, seriously wrong in assuming that the Germans would not advance more than 200 kilometres, that the Russians could keep not only Moscow and Leningrad, but also Kiev, and that the front would become stabilised by the beginning of October at the latest. Was there not an element of bluff in his apparent optimism? One may well wonder whether Stalin was not much more nervous about the general situation than would appear from Hopkins' account. The most striking suggestion that Stalin made to Hopkins was that he would welcome American troops on any part of the Russian front under the complete command of the American army. More alarmists still were to be some of Stalin's dispatches to Churchill as the Wehrmacht made progress in Soviet territory. August 15, 1941, W.S. Churchill and F.D. Roosevelt to I.V. Stalin. We have taken the opportunity afforded by the consideration of the report of Mr. Harry Popkins on his return from Moscow to consult together as to how best our two countries can help your country in the splendid defence that you are putting up against the Nazi attack. We are, at the moment, cooperating to provide you with the very maximum of supplies that you most urgently need. Already many shiploads have left our shores and more will leave in the immediate future. We must now turn our minds to the consideration of a more long-term policy, since there is still a long and hard path to be traversed before there can be won that complete victory without which our efforts and sacrifices would be wasted. The war goes on upon many fronts, and before it is over, there may be yet further fighting fronts that will be developed. Our resources, though immense, are limited, and it must become a question of where and when those resources can best be used to further the greatest extent of our common effort. This applies equally to manufactured war supplies and to raw materials. The needs and demands of your and our armed services can only be determined in the light of the full knowledge of the many facts which must be taken into consideration in the decisions that we take. In order that all of us may be in a position to arrive at speedy decisions as to the apportionment of our joint resources, we suggest that we prepare a meeting which should be held at Moscow to which we would send high representatives who could discuss these matters directly with you. If this conference appeals to you, we want you to know that pending the decisions of that conference, we shall continue to send supplies and material as rapidly as possible. We realise fully how vitally important to the defeat of Hitlerism is the brave and steadfast resistance of the Soviet Union. And we feel, therefore, that we must not in any circumstances fail to act quickly and immediately in this matter of planning the program for the future allocation of our joint resources. In Life and Fate, talking about Stalin, Grossman writes, Churchill and Roosevelt trusted him, but he knew that their trust was by no means unconditional. What annoyed him most was the way, although they were only too willing to confer with him, they always first discussed everything between themselves. They knew very well that wars came and went, but politics remained politics. They admired his logic, his knowledge, the clarity of his reasoning. But he knew they saw him as an Asian potentate, not a European leader. Thank you.